for you that would want to All right. So, uh, well, welcome everyone for uh, the spring 2019 Dean's Lecture to be delivered by Norman Fortenberry. I want to give and maximize the time for Norman to give his presentation. So my introduction of him will be very brief. I probably can tell the personal story, though, that Norman and I first met in Texas officially when we sat down for breakfast. We were basically both out, and we ended up going to a restaurant and having breakfast. If he ordered breakfast tacos, I said, brave man. <laughs> and we went from there. <laughs> With that said, uh, it's my pleasure, uh, uh, and just so you know, I'm Chris Swan, Dean of Undergraduate Education in the School of Engineering, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Norman uh, L. Fortenberry, who is the, currently the Executive Director for the American Society of Four, 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 four. Engineering Education. Close to us. Um, the Society itself was founded in 1893, and the focus is uh, as a global society of individual, institutional, and corporate members who are advancing the innovation, excellence, and access at all levels of, edu in, of education for the engineering profession. Okay? Now, previously, Norman has held roles as, for instance, the Center for the Advancement of Scholarship and Engineering Education at the National Academy of Engineering. He's also held a role at National Science Foundation as a senior advisor as well as program director. Uh, He's also served with the uh, Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering and Science, also called the Jemson uh, Consortium. Um, but he really has engineering as his background because he holds bachelor's, master's, and doctor of science degrees from MIT in mechanical engineering. So without saying any more, I give you Norman Fortenberry. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the introduction. I was just setting my timer because I don't want to blather on, but so long. Um, I want to leave time for Q&A, and I hope to have at least 10 to 15 minutes for that. Uh, can you hear me back in the cheap seats? We're good? OK, fantastic. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. And based on the conversations I've had so far this morning, I don't know that I'm going to tell you anything that you don't already know. But sometimes it's good to have outside reinforcement. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, I'm going to start with a shameless plug for ASWE, give you some context for the engineer of 2040, talk about some desired characteristics, and then educating the engineer of 2040 and looking back to 2010. So first, the shameless plug. Why does ASWE exist? As engineering educators and stakeholders, our first priority is to transform engineering education to graduate the highest potential career-ready engineering workforce that is diverse, creative, and innovative, enhances our capacity to innovate solutions to the most challenging, pressing challenges in our communities, nation, and world, understand the impacts of the solutions on both technical and social systems, and those who are able to adapt to a rapidly evolving technical environment in industry, academia, and society, and play a leading role in advancing technology. So that's sort of short elevator speech about ASWE. Now, officially, our mission, as Chris read, advances ASE, advances implied research, innovation, excellence, and access at all levels of education for the engineering profession. Our vision is to be the preeminent authority on the education of engineering professionals. And our values, excellence, engagement, innovation, integrity, diversity, and inclusion. Our objectives, research, innovation, excellence, access, diversity, and inclusion communities and communication, advocacy and public policy, and we have ones around internal organization and financial stability. This is important because we just came up with these in 2017. Uh, ASE has gone a ways without having, before we re-looked at what our goals and objectives were. So I force you to listen to this because we took a lot of time coming up with it, so somebody should hear it and pay attention to it. What we do thematically, we promote excellence in instruction, research, public service, and practice. We exercise worldwide leadership on our own and with peer societies around the globe. We foster the technological education of society at large. We provide quality products, services, and programs for our members. And we provide a forum for exchanging ideas and sharing of information among the populace at large. As a practical matter, what does that mean? It means we engage in extensive professional development education and how one does one's job better for deans, chairs, faculty, university, 
academic staff and K-12 teachers. Basically, anybody who has anything to do with the education of engineers, we're concerned with how they can do their jobs better. We have a, 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 a sizable engineering libraries division, for example. So maybe not everybody that you would immediately think of, but they're all part of ASEE. We engage in research evaluation and information services. We collect and disseminate student data, faculty data, institutional research volume data, and news about engineering and engineering technology education, as well as engage in legis legislative monitoring. And we operate programs for others, principally the federal government. How many here have heard of the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program? We run that program for the National Science Foundation and have uh, for the past 12 years. So we run that. Well, we manage that, they run it. <laughs> there are inherently federal governmental functions that they do, that, but we do everything else. And then uh, a number of you may be familiar with EcoCar, and we run that for uh, DOE. So the global context of engineering, which includes such things in countries with population growth as a desire for economic development. In countries such as Japan with, Japan with population contraction, there's a desire to maintain standard of living and level of services. We have issues around climate change, pollution, limits to natural resources. Engineering drives modern societies forward within these constraints. And what does that mean? It means that engineering is being depended upon in order to drive economic development in the face of, of these types of challenges and address changes in our natural environment, most of which are due to human action. Now, there have been any number of reports by various nations over the past 10 to 15 years, but there are some very common themes. Among these, concerns about a global shortage of engineers and a consequent need to engage the full population or as much of the population as feasible in engineering, a declining interest in engineering as a career field when people say, if I got to work that hard, I should go into business and make some money, uh, or similar statements to that, and an issue of balancing quality with quantity. You know, we need a lot more, but the ones we need a lot more, we need them to be good. So balancing quality and quantity becomes an issue. Continuing on with these common themes, there are concerns about transactional engineers and national competitiveness. Uh, that's a 20-minute conversation in and of itself, so we'll just leave it as a bullet, and maybe we can get to some of that in Q&A. Concerns about the preparation of engineers within the context of regional agreements. So Bologna in the European Union, Engineer of the Americas, and other international treaties and realities. And then the challenges and opportunities of outcomes-based education, which is what ABET transferred to a number of years ago, and a small door opening to what I call mastery-based education, which presents a whole other set of challenges. Globally, desired characteristics are for engineers able to straddle uncertainty, disciplines, diverse cultures, evolving technologies, and other such things. Engineers able to define as well as solve problems. If you're, engineers are problem solvers. Well, that's true, but we also need to define the problem to be solved because defining the problem correctly can get you a long way toward the solution. And we need engineers who can create, manage, and lead, and lead in technology and policy. Engineers who can drive economic growth and enhance standards of living, so I've some starting to become repetitive now with this economic thing. Blend theory and practice. Blend technical and what we used to call soft skills, we now call professional skills, the teaming, the communication, et cetera and exhibit global awareness and intercultural competence. Being aware of, of differences and commonalities with regard to national borders, ethnicity, religions, etc. It was really silent when I made this presentation, this part of the presentation in the People's Republic of China, and I was talking about the religion part because there was a whole thing going on with the Uyghurs, but anyway. Um, Desired characteristics, and I, and I label this as facts, not assumptions. An increasingly technical world needs people with engineering knowledge, even if they do not practice as engineers. Leave that one to the Q&A. I think there's a lot of examples of why that's true. Diverse thought improves engineering design and production. You don't have to take my word for it. Bill Wolf, former president, National Academy of Engineering, made that point. In order to adequately serve humanity, engineers must understand human needs. It's very difficult to serve a population or a process that you don't understand. 
and failure to engage women or ethnic religious minorities violates the above facts and does not make economic or technical sense. Therefore, attention to diversity should be integral to overall effort to enhance engineering education. Therefore, engineers have to be more agile and facile across engineering, physical science, and social science fields, working with non-engineering professionals. So engineers not only have to work with other technical professionals, they have to work with non-technical professionals. And engineers have to be able to communicate with the general public. There are issues now that we're seeing with engineers and IT workers increasingly socially active. There are the examples of the workers at Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft walking off the job for various and sundry reasons. Concerns about ethics of being involved with uh, some of the uh, national security agency work, some of the DOD work, concerns about sexual harassment policies, concerns about other ethical issues. The students who are coming out now are very concerned about these social issues and we have to recognize that as part of the educational process. So, in 1942, and I can't read all this, so I'll let you read it for yourselves. This is from 1942, I want to stress that, by William Wickenden, who was 1929-1947 president of what is now Case Western Reserve University and was ASEE president from 1933 to 1934. Now, you got to change men to people. But beyond that, this is a fairly broad view of what has to happen and what the realities are of with whom engineers work. And that's from 1942. And then take this view from 2010. So it's a, it's a particular, I lost my mouse. I had a mouse. Ah, there's the mouse. Okay. There are people who deal in big ideas, big implications, big issues. They make plans, history, waves. There's a name for people like that. They break down barriers, problems, illusions. They change landscapes, economies, minds. There's a name for people like that. They study humanity, culture, nature, to shape society, policy, the future. They see challenges as opportunities. There's a name for people like that. You might call these people designers, creators, investigators, explorers, problem solvers, change agents, leaders, visionaries, but we call them engineers. We are the Bobby B. Lyle School of Engineering at SMU. So I just thought that was a neat ad. Um, they only ran it for six months and then they moved on, but I thought it really captured, again, the breadth of what we're talking about and what we're looking for. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about a report that ASWE did, a series of reports called Transforming Undergraduate Education of Engineers, TUEE, and it was a multi-phase initiative that seek to, sought to identify critical components of engineering curricula, pedagogy, and engineer educational culture that frame the basis of the transformation of engineers over the next decades into the 21st century. In terms of the curriculum, uh, well, why foreshadow? I just go to, we'll just jump right into it and save some time for t discussion. So as I said, four reports. Uh, phase one looked at industry views on desired knowledge, skills, abilities, and attitudes. Phase two, student views. Phase three, achieving gender equity. And phase four, views of faculty and professional societies. As a person who flew here this morning, I just want to continually make the point that no one wants to be in the plane designed by the engineer who received poor grades. <laughs> Engineers affect lives. And so talent is usually not innate. 
and it does not depend on gender, sex, ethnicity, or geography. So we need to take talent where it exists, develop it, and move it onto an educated level. Uh, I believe we started this series in 2014. So phase one observations, these are the views of industry, T-shaped professional, boundary crossing competencies, uh, teamwork, communication, again, uh, the professional skills, networking, critical thinking, global understanding, project management, et cetera, uh, many disciplines, many systems of application, but some technical depth in at least one discipline, analytical thinking, problem solving, and deep in at least one system. So that's sort of what industry had to say. And in general, their ideal student had these characteristics, which you can read faster than I can read them to you. But the recommendations are interesting. Industry was recommending, or the recommendations for industry was to share responsibility with universities for developing engineers and to create internships in industry for students and faculty. Too many of our engineering faculty are trying to prepare, prepare future professionals for something about which they know nothing, casting no aspersions. Um, and there is an assumption, there are assumed learnings that happen with a summer internship or a co-op, less so with a co-op because it's normally closer coordination. But it would seem that there is an opportunity, and at least the people who were involved in the study group saw it, to more tightly couple what we hope the students learn in a work experience back into the formal academic program. You know, you assume that students will pick up certain skills during an internship. Is there a way to communicate that more formally to the employers in your universe and have them take time to ensure that that happens, irrespective of the level of student that they are engaged with? So, this was, this was, I thought, a, a really neat idea. And then the recommendation for universities was to place a greater premium on teaching and to adjust the faculty uh, award and reward culture in that regard. And again, this was a national report, so um, keep that in mind. With regard to phase two, the specific recommendations from students, I got four slides on this. Students want early access to mentoring, engineering experiences, and advising, which sort of makes sense, open-ended interdisciplinary projects undertaken by groups that change composition over time, forcing students to adapt to new partners. On the forcing part, I will say, it is highly inefficient to stick students in a group and say, you're going to do group work and you're going to learn how to work as a team. Forcing them to learn that on their own might actually encourage deeper learning, but it may not be the most efficient. So if we're going to put students in teams to have them learn teaming, it would be helpful if we told them what it skills and knowledge we were hoping they were going to acquire from that experience rather than sort of making it a side activity. Focus on real world impact, and we can do that in any number of ways, case studies, internships, et cetera, co-ops, guest speakers, any number of ways to do that. And enhancing the connection between students and professors by creating a sense of community. A number of very creative. I keep getting these calls. I apologize. The, yeah, the, the, problem, the problem is that the FCC is not controlling all the, anyway, let me not, <laughs> we, we won't go off on that tangent. Additional recommendations, team design projects starting in the freshman year uh, that benefit someone or some organization, and there are examples of that on a number of campuses. Building design projects into upper level courses, uh, a diversity of professors, that takes a little bit more time to build in depending upon where you are as a campus and to showing the applications of engineering in the uh, preparatory math and science classes. And again, that can be done. And on some campuses, that's a real tension. In some places, they deal with that by the engineering colleges. We're going to just teach all these things ourselves. Uh, that's a little bit harder on public universities where there are tuition issues in terms of who gets how much money. Uh, but even on private campuses, there can be some tension over that. So uh, encouraging a conversation across faculties to make sure that students are acquiring the skill sets that we want them to have uh, is an important thing to do. More student recommendations. Encourage faculty to be creative in supplying real world examples, incorporating writing and presentation, again the communication skills. Uh, 
offer minor credit or certificates of proficiency was, was an idea that uh, the students had, and redistributed grading uh, to increase the value of project-based learning as opposed to exams. And there are some really creative ways that research shows uh, are, are uh, uh, useful and uh, accurate in terms of having students grade each other's work uh, in addition to having the faculty member judge their own work. And there are ways uh, to, to judge group work and accurately assign uh, recognition of individual effort. And finally, offering a single course combining ethics, business, and entrepreneurship, uh, make it required for professors to learn how to teach. This isn't just an engineering thing. Within the U.S., to the best of my current knowledge, and I don't remember the example, there is only one discipline in higher education that absolutely positively requires its faculty to demonstrate knowledge of teaching across higher ed. Uh, follow the example of one school that holds a startup weekend twice a year, including alumni and business representatives, and a course already offered in one school called Concepts of Professional Practice that includes resume writing and career-oriented instruction. This was a graphic which is kind of washed out by the lights, but it shows where we're trying to go is to help the students for, to discover for themselves the intersections of what they're good at, what earns the money, what they love, and what the world needs. And so in this particular offering, that total intersection is called your purpose, dream, job, true vocation. And that basically sort of to me summarize what we're trying to do uh, in education. So phase two, recommendations, distilled recommendations from the students comes down to the real world projects, the team design projects, show engineering applications, have the faculty use their passion and expertise, teaching as part of tenure, which it is, but we're talking about balance and relative value, encouraging creativity, improving accountability, and for institutions to improve early access to mentoring, to create sense of community and hire diverse professors. So phase three, which was focused on gender equity and increasing uh, women's participation. Uh, had this four frame model, looked at equipping the underrepresented group member, creating equal opportunity, valuing diversity, and revisioning engineering culture. And what we can do then, thank you, that was a good idea. Uh, to equip the underrepresented group member is to connect the professionals with role models, use real world engineering problems, provide research opportunities, and emphasize social relevance. To create equal opportunity, we need to base hiring decisions on objective information. And again, we know this from other examples and other disciplines. You know, this is why they do the blind auditions and orchestras, et cetera, et cetera. Decentralize admissions, remove gender information from evaluation scenarios, and institute gender inclusive policies. Excuse me, how do we value difference? We introduced diversity metrics and accreditation. ABET has been working on this one for about three years now on how they, how they would actually go about doing that. Um, hiring and promoting women, recruiting diverse candidates, and identifying champions. So the workshop recommendations in terms of society and inner society activities, support technological literacy for all, create a secretary of education position in all societies, that's not going anywhere, but it's a nice idea. Uh, education track and conferences, curriculum map with a body of knowledge for each of the KSA, knowledge, skills, and abilities, pool of technical speakers, uh, advocates for changes in ABET criteria, ABET has changed criteria, which has now been a big fight, uh, but I think the fight is mostly over now, but they went from A through K to, what is it, one through, one through seven. Wasn't that a big change? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, De-silo disciplinary societies, uh, faculty industry exchange, education tracks, workshops, and competition and challenges. The whole thing around uh, competition is very popular in terms of allowing students some space for creative efforts to uh, both acquire the material and demonstrate their knowledge of material. And in terms of faculty support, uh, teaching workshops, case studies and making those available. National, of National Academy of Engineering has an ethics uh, center that uh, 
took over what was once an ethics case study portal, uh, developing modules that faculty can use, and paying more attention to the reward system, et cetera. And student support. Financial support uh, to get students out into conferences so they can see uh, what's happening within the discipline, uh, integrating student activities into conferences, and building career services from applying to interviewing so that students have some facility with these things before they actually hit the job market and offering. Some of this can be done with instructional videos. So there are some radical new educational models that are out there. Uh, the U.S. Is, uh, US has a, uh, uh, the Make School Dominican University BS in Applied Computer Science that happens in two years. Uh, United Kingdom has the new model in technology and engineering, which is a three-year program, very tightly integrated with industry. Uh, within the U.S., Olin, not too far up the road, some direction or other, I'm in the direction of challenge right now. <laughs> Four years, no tenure, no departments. Within Australia, Charles Stewart, 5.5 years combined BSMS. And they have a lot of little micro courses that you cobble together. Uh, and also nearby, uh, Station One, which is blended STEM. And it's still figuring out what it is, but it's, it's there and they're going to do something. Uh, all blend formal instruction with practical work. And the big questions that are around that then are in terms of replicability, scalability, and sustainability in terms of an actual educational program. We do have some guidance on innovating educational models within existing institutions. So if you can't start from, from a you know, blank slate, clean field, what do we do? Uh, this was a report, Royal Academy of Engineering at MIT from 2012. Wow, that was a while ago. OK, uh, they made several relevant observations in terms of change being driven by acknowledged need. Assessment is necessary but not sufficient. Innovation has to be embedded within the core of the curriculum, and there are ways to do that. And we have to look department-wide, which is why NSF has something called uh, Revolutionizing Engineering Departments, the RED program, NSF Engineering Directorate. And sustained change depends on engaging a cross-section of faculty and administrators, because top-down alone does, definitely does not work, and bottom-up is iffy on its own. So we need, we need both sides working together, so top-down, bottom-up together faculty and administrators. So this is the report that I referenced over lunch for those of you who want to see it. This is a National Academy of Engineering report on understanding educational and career pathways of engineers. And it makes several important points that degreed engineers work on a wide variety of fields. And we need to acknowledge that in how we prepare future engineers. Non-technical knowledge, skills, and abilities are increasingly important and promoted. I made that point already. And real world experiences should be an integral part of engineering education. So I've beaten you to death with that one as well. And this was a December 2018 report. So I organized in my head the engineering education system as a transformation model. Uh, this is after Hoopka Nieder way back in 1988. So we have the technical system has input and output. This is, your, this is you on engineering learning. Uh, the transformation system is a teaching and learning assessment processes. The human system is the teachers and learners. Uh, the tools are the curricular labs and technology. There's a goal system to drive this, which is set not only by the department, the university, the professional societies, employers, etc. And there's a set of constraints and external influences, which includes social, cultural, political, economic influencers as well as external stakeholders. And if we think of engineering education as a system, we can take a systems approach uh, to realize how we can improve it and make it better. So the question then becomes, how do we educate engineers? We obviously have the formal curricula, co-curricular activities, experiential learning, social activities. And I think you were talking about Engineers Without Borders earlier, research and other mentored activities. And the question that I bring to it is, is there a role for mastery versus competency? I talked about the being in the engineer and worrying about the, the, the C or D student designing it. In my perfect world, we would keep every student for as long as it takes for them to master the content. As long as they wanted to be an engineer, we would help them to be an engineer, but you don't get out until you master the content. Practical issues with that in terms of 
okay, but how do we schedule labs if we don't know who's going to be taking what when because they haven't gotten there yet? Uh, the Carnegie unit sort of is master of all in terms of, you know, three unit course, et cetera. We got to find some way to make a transition because I think it's mastery education that really uh, holds the potential for us to achieve our goals. Um, I want to talk a, a little bit about EPICS, uh, Engineering Projects and Community Service, because we talked a little bit about community service, and I think you've got some of that here. Uh, this uh, EPICS, under that label, started at Purdue, um, but is now a, a global activity. Um, and the neat thing about EPICS is that it's part of the formal curriculum. Uh, so students sign up for it, they take that class, and the really neat thing about EPICS is that you can take it through all four years. Um, and the truly neat thing about it from my perspective is that it teaches an important engineering lesson in that you may be a junior and suddenly you're called upon to address an issue from five years ago. Had nothing to do with you. you you're just a junior and this is from five years ago. And I think it teaches the lesson that as an engineer, particularly an engineer employed in a company, you're called upon to stand behind your company. And so whether or not you were involved in the original project, you've got to update it because it's out of date or update it because something broke. And that, that I thought, was a, was a particularly important lesson. Um, the social activities, Engineers Without Borders, very good, Habitats for Humanity, et cetera, all that uh, has, has, has value. So I have spoken a little bit faster than I planned. I got five minutes left according to the clock, but we have only 10 minutes for questions. So somehow it worked out because now it is time for questions. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. So I hope there are questions, because if there aren't, I'll be deeply disappointed. I'm going to talk about Chris all the way home. <laughs> Which That's discipline it. was it that requires uh, preparation and teaching? I, I can't remember that. It is not, it is not. <laughs> no, 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 it is not. <laughs> I, know, I know why he asked that. It is not, <laughs> it is not a scientific or technical discipline. Is it education? It is not education. It is not education. It is not education. Why was research in brackets in your opening slide? Uh, because uh, when the ASEE board approved our vision, mission, values, they didn't put research in, but it was sort of implied in the conversation. So I had to put it in brackets because as executive director, I have to represent the organization and its board in what they formally approved. But it's there. I feel like that some days. <laughs> Sir. At lunch, we talked 5% of the college yes. entrants are pursuing engineering. Yes, sir. And that SMU yes. pitch of 10 years ago, the music's a little stale. <laughs> but actually, where is the responsibility for marketing engineering as a career? Oh, boy. OK, so this gets, this gets to a whole other level of challenge. Some number of years ago, I think at least 10, because I've been at ASE for a wow. Some number of years ago, um, National Academy of Engineering uh, did something about um, uh, what was called, um, how, do we, how do we communicate engineering? Um, and that was a project where they, they actually did a study with what appeals to young audiences, et cetera. Um, and I'm going blank on the term, but it'll come to me eventually. And they presented that to all the engineering societies and said, here, here are the words that you should use. The challenge is, I guess not unusual in any organization, people like to have their own identity. And so they had to put this spin on it for the EEs or that spin on it for the civils or the other spin on it. So we couldn't agree on a message, although we were sort of globally agreeing. Um, so that was one problem, that all the engineering societies who absolutely have a vested interest in more engineers couldn't quite agree on one message. Second problem, you look, that you may be old enough to remember LA, in, LA Law as, a, 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 as a television show. Some of you definitely are not. It was a television show that was immensely popular, and all the engineers looked at it with great jealousy because Ooh, LA Law is on it. All these students want to be engineers. And you could tell when it came on, you could see the shift in majors. And the same thing happened with CSI, another show before your time. 
Everybody wanted to be a crime scene investigator, which has to be objectively one of the most boring jobs in the world. But it was a fantastic <laughs> TV show and everybody wanted to be one. And we said, why can't we have that? We need LA engineer. And we were saying that five years after the show went off the air. We need that. And so people created various versions of these things. And you've heard the phrase, clutch your pearls? Some of you? OK, I see people nodding. There was a clutch your pearls moment when the engineering community realized that for a television show to be on television, You've got to have people sleeping with people who are not their spouses. You've got to have murder. You've got to have mayhem. You've got to have the human drama. And engineers were not into that drama. We don't want that, we don't want that associated with engineers. But, but, but what happened? You were all excited about LA Law. They got people sleeping all over the place. Yeah, but, but, but we're, we're, we're engineers. We should do, you know, we can do the nice shows where we do the experiments and then we explain. Some, but that's not the mass market. <laughs> Closest we've gotten was back in the ancient days, we had the original MacGyver. And now MacGyver's back with a new MacGyver. But you ever notice they don't give this MacGyver a girlfriend? Everybody else has a girlfriend or MacGyver. Nothing. Um, now, there was a show, Scorpion, for a little while, which disappeared on me. I'm not sure what happened. It was on last semester and then was gone. Um, yeah, the engineering community really just, no, we don't, we don't do the whole murder, mayhem, sleeping around thing. It's not, not our thing. And that's, so that's part of the challenge in terms of how do we recruit, how do we build interest. You've got to be willing to unify your message. And if you're going to reach out and put yourself in the mass meeting, you've got to show people that you're just like other people. And it's got to ride in the background. Oh, these are engineers. I should check out that. So I, I personally believe that's part of the challenge. Long answer to a short question, apologize. That's all a question. Okay, we got here and then here. Uh, may I ask you a question about your talk? There's only one part I don't understand. Okay. What's the argument for decentralizing admission? There are assumptions. We t uh oh, I said my time's up. There are assumptions. Okay, stop already. You, you, you feel that? Okay, fine. There are assumptions made about who can be an engineer. Within engineering colleges or schools, they're beginning to realize, and we have for a little while, that different types of students can contribute and be very successful engineers. People in central admissions haven't quite caught up with that at most schools. And so they will filter out students who don't fit their image of who can be a successful engineer. And so the thought was that by decentralizing admissions, Engineers could make their own decision about who they wanted as engineers, just like you do at the graduate level. Mm -hmm. so that was it. Interesting. Sir. Yeah, I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on what innovative approaches could be taken to enhance representation of scientists and engineers in Congress <laughs> and also in state and uh, federal positions of, of you know, responsibility. That's a hard one in this country. Um, we had, I will say that in the most recent election cycle, 2016, we had a lot more scientists and engineers running for office. Uh, a lot of that was driven by just anger at how people were approaching climate change, et cetera. Um, it's a culture change within the professions. Scientists and engineers value data and evidence. In glittering generalities, because I don't want to make hard statements, to be successful in the political realm, you have to connect with emotion. I have to feel that you will represent me. I have to know that you feel my pain, whatever my pain happens to be. And so when you have a populace that isn't trained in how to make that connection and communicate that connection, they will do relatively less well. A, they will do less well if they get that far. But B, they will be less inclined to enter that sphere. Uh, so if we're going to want more scientists and engineers to run, we're actually going to have to do more. And I'll give AAAS credit. They do some things in terms of putting uh, scientists and engineers as interns on Capitol Hill and in federal agencies. Uh, they do some work. That's, part of that is building comfort because a number of those 
fellows will then turn around and run for office locally, nationally, statewide. Uh, we've got to build a bridge uh, of comfort, but I think there's also a role uh, just in terms of being willing to be the local expert for the elected member. Any other questions? Sir? You talked a bit about a diversity champion. I was wondering what your ideas were there in relation to some of the research that's coming out that shows that when people are identified as diversity champions, they don't have enough time to actually do research and to teach classes. And how do you balance being a diversity champion and actually being a professor? Well, a diversity champion is a service activity. You're expected to do a certain amount of service, so we need to acknowledge that this is a service activity and it swaps out whatever other service activity you might be called upon to do, or some portion of it more realistically. Uh, you're called upon to do an immense amount of service uh, to your discipline, to your college, to your university, to the nation. Carve some of that out and be a diversity champion. Um, I acknowledge the time sink involved. Uh, but it doesn't always have to be a time sink. It's a matter of, much like with the Me Too movement, there was a series of commercials that got to, who was it that just got in trouble for all the commercials? Gillette. Uh, Gillette commercials. Isn't Gillette well, somewhat well? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, so it's a matter of when somebody makes a comment saying, um, let, me, let me challenge you on your comment. That didn't take a lot of time. So I don't have to be a diversity champion 20% of my time. I just have to be willing to speak up when somebody says something that they probably know they shouldn't say, but they get away with it because I didn't say anything because you know, it's not my fight. I, 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 I got to work with these people. Speak up. As a, as a, as a friend of mine uh, who uh, now is uh, president of the Minnesota Museum of Science, says, you know, sometimes you just get tired of dealing with stuff. So, you know, yes, I didn't speak up, but why didn't you? So, take a little bit of time, speak up. Ma'am, and then, sir. So some of the, could you talk about maybe some of the markers of change you're getting? So if I think about, like, the, the NAU report in 2020, like, mm -hmm. a lot of these things are the same. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing as mark? Oh, what are we seeing as markers of progress, or are we still really still in the same fight? We're in the same fight, but we've made incremental progress down the road. So now there's recognition that certain things are required, and we're fighting over. Well, how do we do that? Uh, can we do it, you know, quick and dirty and cheap, and call it a day? Or do we really have to invest some time in this stuff like it's a real issue? Um, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's incremental, but there's progress. Sir? Um, we, we were just talking about a um, few things about um, engineers and, and, and scientists are less inclined to participate in the political process. Yeah. Um, I, I think in that sense, it put more pressure on uh, professional societies mm -hmm. like ASEE mm -hmm. to play a bigger role yep. on public policy, being an advocate yep. for uh, the professions. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit of what ASEE's role in this, uh, being the uh, public advocate uh, for engineering. We are ramping up our role in that regard. Um, we are now working with one of one of the premier DC advocacy firms. We don't lobby; we advocate. Uh, although we can up to twenty percent. Anyway, uh, we advocate uh, stronger attention to engineering, engineering education, etc. We are also envisioning, and I'm actually going into a, a planning session in another week. But we are envisioning uh, developing tools to assist our members. Uh, to be more effective at the local and state level as well in terms of providing them with tools to provide information. In the context particularly of a state university, you don't want to wait until there's a crisis. You want to have a constant flow of information to the local um, political policy administrative types. Hey, we're here. These are the wonderful things we're doing. You should come by our campus, see things, understand how we contribute to the economy, to policy, to jobs, et cetera. That's a continuous thing. 
so that when something that is contentious arises, there is a level of comfort in A, who you are, B, what you stand for in terms of your educational values, and C, that you can be a trusted source who isn't going to get them in trouble. And so we are working on building a tool set that we can provide to our members so they can engage in that process continually instead of waiting for the crisis. Other societies are even more vigorous in terms of specific advocacy around specific lines of technology, areas of research, et cetera. I saw, yes sir. I'm surprised you're not advocating for us having students participate in programs abroad. Oh, absolutely. Um, there is extreme value in that. The challenge in glittering generalities for engineering programs is that most are so tightly programmed that students really don't feel they have the flexibility to do study abroad. Um, there are a few exceptions, uh, but, but in general, uh, engineering students, if they do that, will do that over a summer uh, because they feel they, they can't do it uh, during the academic year. A uh, couple of consortia, global engineering education, uh, GE, that's only two E's, there's GE3, um, and there's another group whose acronym I'm forgetting, but there are a couple of places devoted to it, but it's, it's, it's a challenge for most engineering programs to have students engage in a, an authentic, extended semester length uh, <coughs> study abroad activity. But for those who can, it's absolutely wonderful on what it does for them. There are um, some places where they, they attempt to get close to approximating by having students from a, a partner institution work together on a project virtually. Uh, and so you're working with a team in Japan or Singapore or Sweden or whatever, and so you're learning the language thing and the assumptions, the cultural assumptions about what engineers do. You just have to deal with the time lag and somebody is up at you know, 4 a.m. because you're on different parts of the globe. I saw, yes sir. With respect to engaging more engineers in the political process, mm -hmm. um, what would you think about the idea of training engineers more in rhetoric as well as logic, i.e. as part of the formal curriculum? I think there's value in that. Um, I think there's particular value because, again, because most engineers are employed in industry, the ability to sell, in quotes, to, to advance your position uh, through rhetorical skill is a valuable skill. Um, if you, I made this point during lunch, it, it, if, so, if you can't explain how what you did is the best thing since sliced bread, then why should I invest in you? So there's absolute value in doing that, and that skill is transferable in a, in a variety of domains. So I would, I would support some version of that. The issue is squeezing it in, and typically that means integrating it into an existing course, which is a battle, or a separate course, which is an even bigger battle. Are we done? Are we done? We got one last question. One last question. You talked about an engineering education system and thinking yes. of it as a whole. So that kind of plays into what you're saying. You know, when we get calls from um, companies saying we have 40 positions, we need engineers, mm -hmm. um, they tell us what they need when we hear. Um, you know, the mm -hmm. curriculum committee is constantly working to revise that. Can you talk a little bit more about your thoughts on a, a successful education system? Okay, so what I'm debating internally now is how much trouble I want to get in. Um, <laughs> there are obviously any number of people, students, and, and engineering schools who see a local client set, employers, and, and they are doing matchmaking through the educational process. Different schools have different client sets. Some are local, some are regional, some are national, some are global. We just accept that. What I think may have been lost over time, because we do have so many engineers employed in industry, although there's now a rising interest in entrepreneurship, is thought of engineers taking responsibility for their community in and of themselves. So if you go all the way back to the Middle Ages when we had guilds of various and sundry kinds, the guild controlled. And the guild said, this is what we do and how we do it. And we're going to continuously improve. 
And if you want to hire a member of our guild, that's fine. We're happy with that. It was also a way of maintaining labor and prices, etc. But ultimately, your responsibility as a member of the guild is to the guild, not to the person hiring you for job A or job B or job C. We reached a point at some point when engineers saw their responsibilities as to their employer instead of to the profession. And that speaks to something about the role of professional societies, et cetera. In that transition, I think we lost some of what answers your question in terms of what responsibility do we believe we have as a profession of engineers, irrespective of what any given employer wants at any given point in time. Because we have to remember and recall that there is something called the business cycle. And as much as they want 40 engineers right now, in five years they may decide they have 20 engineers too many. Uh, or you talk to the hiring manager, I need engineers who know I'm going to mention something. Anvil 3.7, talk to the CEO, I need somebody who can fastle and communicate and can help run this business unit. So industry is not speaking yet with one voice. And, and we need, as, a, as engineers, to be aware of that and to try to balance how do we provide a supply but also maintain the profession. responsibility of the School of Engineering to make sure that we, one, congratulate our speakers, number two, we actually provide them with some going away present. So here's the official going away present from the School of Engineering, which is basically your poster. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> the key piece is that Tufts is on the bottom. Uh, yes. So that when you put this up in your office, it stays, it stays. and it stays Tufts. But that's, that's not enough. That's not enough. So here we go. We have the Tufts Engineering Glasses. Because <laughs> we want to make sure. There we go. There we go. All right. We, we, we have the School of Engineering jacket. Okay. Nice. Please, you can tell me if it fits or not. Okay. Just let me know. Okay. We have the uh, Gordon Institute. Because we, we want all components here. We recognize the Gordon Institute. Because I'm about to take notebook and pen. Notebook and pen. Okay. And <laughs> you do that very well. I'm not going to open this up, but it is what it is, right? So we talked at lunch about a wine making process. This is really for Pilsner beer. So there are two steins in here, okay? That you may that you may have. Again, the Gordon Institute, right? Making sure that's the, okay. So again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and particularly uh, Norman, I, 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 let me, can I tell the story about how I got you here? Sure. Just, just to make it clear. <laughs> so Norman first became the executive director of ASEE, and I asked him like a year after that, I said, you know, we got to get you to come to Tufts. You know, can you come? He said, okay, give me a year to, you know, to work through the uh, ASEE stuff. All right, six years later, <laughs> I asked him, I said, by the way, I remember that you promised me that you would be doing this. I was expecting no response at all. He said, yes, here it is. So, in fact, I appreciate it.